on camera. Today is Monday, July 11th, 2016. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History Programs here at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Lloyd Whitaker, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps during the Korean War. Mr. Whitaker's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Whitaker, and thank you for, partic for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? My name is Lloyd Tate Whitaker. Tate is T-A-I-T. -T. It was my mother's maiden name, and I live in Buckhead, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early life and growing up? I grew up in Greensboro, Georgia, a little town of 2,500 people, about 70 miles east of Atlanta, now on I-20. I-20 has more or less passed Greensboro by, but you used to have to go through Greensboro to get to Augusta. Okay. And we had one red light in the middle of town, and in its wisdom, the city council decided that half the people weren't stopping. So we put another red light in so that they were staggered. You couldn't get through both of them. And uh, that's where I grew up, and I loved it. Okay. Uh, what was schooling like in Greensboro? Schooling was uh, in Greensboro uh, Grammar School and High School. We had our own school system. My mother was a high school homeroom history teacher. I managed to avoid her homeroom, uh, and we had two homerooms. There were 52 people in my graduating class, and uh, it was a memorable experience. I graduated from high school when I was 15 because I had skipped a grade and because I graduated from the last 11-year high school in Georgia. The next year was no graduating class, and it went to 12 years. So I went to college at age 15, and uh, my parents told me that I wasn't about to go even to the University of Georgia, which was only 40 miles away in Athens. So I went to Emory at Oxford, a division of Emory University, which was in Oxford, Georgia, Covington, Georgia, 20 miles away. What, what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated from high school in 1950. Okay. Graduated from Emory in 1954. Went right in the Marine Corps okay. after a summer job, and uh, there I am. What, what was your draw? What, why the Marine Corps as opposed to the Army or the Navy? Or? I guess... I uh, I chose the Marine Corps because it was the best. All right. Absolutely. Uh, my friend, my fraternity brother, and I graduated together. We'd roomed together. He was my big brother in the fraternity, and he elected to go in the Army as an enlisted man. And uh, I elected to go OCS, Officer Candidate School, in the U.S. Marine Corps. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What was what Oh, was that, that like? was very exciting. I mentioned when we were warming up that uh, as I checked in, I went a day early thinking I'd get a head start on being a Marine. And as fate would have it, my drill instructor was at the main gate when I checked in and he said, oh, you're going to be in officer candidate school. Said, I happen to be going down that way. Said, I'll ride in your car with you. And he did. And uh, if you can believe this, this is a true story. We got down to the parking lot, which was about two blocks from the OCS barracks. And we went in the trunk of my car where I had my tennis racket and my golf clubs. And he said, oh, I don't think we'll need those. And I said, oh, is that right? And he said, here, let me carry your bag. And I said, well, you know, in my mind, I said, I'm going to be an officer, and he's just a sergeant. So I let him carry my bag. And we got down to the dark barracks, and he grabbed me by the front of my shirt and threw me up against the wall. And I won't tell you what he called me, but uh, 
<laughs> he let me know right away that I was uh, lower than whale excrement, which resides on the bottom of the ocean. Well, that's interesting. I mean, how, what, how did you react to that? Well, I was scared. I was the only one in a dark barracks, and uh, I, my rack was Marine Corps vernacular rack stands for bed. I was on the upper bunk, and as fate would have it, my lower bunkmate uh, showed up the next day, and he had a pair of leopard skin underwear, and uh, that diverted the attention from me. I was a marked man, but I won't tell you, when he fell out in that leopard skin underwear, it was no longer Lloyd, it was down there. <laughs> Thank God for small blessings. Yes. So what was OCS like? OCS was very difficult for me. I had uh, Achilles tendonitis. We were in cold, cold weather right on the Potomac River. And during one of the 26 mile hikes, uh, my boots, froze and marked my tendons right back here on the back of my leg. And from that point on, I could hardly walk. And I knew what the result of being washed out of OCS would be, which meant going to Paris Island and doing four years as an enlisted man. And uh, I, tried to tough it out. I, I actually didn't realize I was being tested to see if I really wanted to be an officer in the Marine Corps, which I was. And I asked, I wore sponges and I did everything I possibly could to get over it. They used to carry me in a six by to where we were having maneuvers because I couldn't hike. And of course, th there I was, the only guy in the truck driving out, and other people had walked 26 miles or some distance, and it was very trying, but I made it. Did, uh, did you receive special attention? I did, <laughs> very special. Uh, going back to the opening night, my drill instructor, who was named Glenn Johnson, to this day I remember it, uh, he, took me aside, he said, Whitaker, you're from Georgia. He said, I'm from Arkansas. He said, I'm from the hills of Arkansas. But he said, I expect more out of you than I do these Yankee boys. And he did. So how long was OCS? Uh, I went in in November and graduated in February. Okay. That was a so, fairly long uh, yeah, period. Yeah, it was a long period. Yeah. And we had uh, only occasional leave. I mean, we frankly had leave every weekend, but just as we would get ready to leave, there would be something that turned up that would modify the uh, permission to leave, and we'd have to spend the weekend there. So you were commissioned at the end of the OCS process? Yes, I was. What happened after that? I went to basic school at Camp Upshur, uh, and that was about a three-month exercise. I was single at the time and uh, it was again difficult. I learned though I had a gold bar on my collar that I still call the sergeant sir. <laughs> and uh, rightly so. My sergeant had uh, just returned, my drill instructor in basic school had just returned from Korea and it was reputed that he had killed 14 gooks with his shovel, with his entrenching tool after he ran out of ammunition in his foxhole. And uh, we all had great respect for him. He deserved to be called sir. Did, uh, was there a lot of information uh, about Korea at the time? I mean, did, were you pretty sure you were going to Korea? Oh, I knew I was going. I knew that when I went in. Okay. I mean, I, I uh, I also knew what the expected life expectancy of a second lieutenant was, at least what it was reported to be. I don't know whether that was accurate or not, but uh, what, what, I, I knew all those things. When, uh, as you were completing the, the basic school training process, what, 
what were the MOSs that they were talking about filling? 0302 was the principal one. That's a that's a rifleman. Uh, it's a grunt, as we call them. I uh, I wanted to be an aviator, and I frankly lied my way down to Pensacola. Uh, I would get in the room with the guy that was taking my hearing, and I'd cut my eye over, and I'd see him press the button, and I'd press my button, and uh, that worked till they put me in a refrigerator. And then the guy in about five minutes came and said, there must be a short in this line. <laughs> he said, I've been pressing my button and you're not responding. So they washed me out of that and I had an, an aviation MOS, but obviously I never became an aviator. Well, how long were you at Pensacola? Uh, very short period of time. Yeah. Very short period. Just long enough for them to figure out I was deaf. <laughs> and I'm wearing hearing aids today. Okay. So what, what did they assign you? What job did they assign you? I, report, I was given orders to report to Cherry Point, okay. and, uh, which is a Marine Corps Air Station, Cherry Point. And I was reporting to a uh, mass squadron, Marine Air Support Squadron, which is a radar squadron directing uh, Marine fighter planes to the enemy by radar. And uh, that's what I did. What year was that, or what time frame was that? That was 1954. 54, okay. I got out of basic school in, uh, let's see, it must have been about May of 50, 55, I'm sorry, 55. Mm -hmm. And I went in in 54. Graduated from OCS in February, went into basic school in March, and probably was there through June. What was happening in Korea about that time? People were getting killed. Okay. This was before the truce. Uh, the truce came along about this period. I don't remember exactly when. and. Uh, you know, a number of us who knew that we had been slated to go to Korea breathed a sigh of relief that we weren't going, but but uh, that's the way it worked out. Did you, you, did you stay at Cherry Point for your whole tour? Uh, believe it or not, as I reported in, I had another uh, life-changing experience. These were the days when one carried in the Marine Corps gloves and a swagger stick. Swagger stick is probably uh, 15 inches long, has a silver tip on both ends and a Marine Corps emblem at the top end. And you wrap your gloves around that and you stand at attention. And I reported in to a major who had the duty at the air station the day I reported in and I was standing at attention in front of his desk with my swagger stick under my arm, and he had my file. It looked like my file there. I don't know whether it really was or not. And he said, oh, Lieutenant Whitaker. He said, uh, do you smoke? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, do you drink? And I said, Yes, sir, in a social occasion, I do drink. He said, well, do you dance? And I thought, <laughs> what do you think when a major, you know, I hadn't seen that many majors in my life. And he asked me if I dance, and I said, well, yes, sir, I, with uh, young ladies, I do. And uh, he said, do you play cards? And I said, well, I know how to hold the cards, yes, sir. And he said, well, the general is looking for an aide. He wants someone that is shorter than he is. I'm 5'7". The general was 5'10". He wants a non-aviator because he doesn't believe he should take an aviator out of the rotation. And uh, these other questions were just preliminary, but he said, I think maybe you qualify. We'll put your name in the pot. And I said, yes, sir, as you would expect, and went away and reported into my squadron. And I didn't hear anything for a long time, completely had forgotten about it. And I had the duty 
one weekend and on Saturday I got a call and this voice said, this is Lieutenant Boggs, I'm General Croft's aide and the general would like to see you over here in 15 minutes. And I thought it was somebody in my squadron pulling my leg. <laughs> And I said, well, you tell the general, I don't think I'll be able to make it in 15 minutes. He said, Lieutenant, I don't know who you think you are, but I am Lieutenant Boggs, and the general does want you over here in 15 minutes. Here's my phone number if you'd like to call me back, and you'll get the general secretary. And I did. I called him back, and the secretary <laughs> answered the phone, General Croft's office, and I thought, oh boy, I have really stepped in it now. But I did get over there probably a little more than 15 minutes and we had a nice interview. General Croft was one of the nicest people I've ever known. Was he the commanding general of the, of the He had the air station at okay, that time. Okay, the air station, all right, yeah. And he was, had orders to the 1st Marine Air Wing in Korea. And uh, so I was going to Korea anyhow and there I went. I uh, got the job and we... Uh, Did you have any kind of training or preparation for aid be, duty? For being an aide? Yeah. My mother. <laughs> a, an aide, as you probably know, in the Marine Corps, uh, I would describe the job. You, you wore something that was called a loafer looper on your shoulder that said you were an aide, but you didn't loaf your job was to take care of that man who was the general that you were an aide to. And uh, General Croft, as I said, was a remarkable guy. He was uh, Naval Academy class of 1928, aviator. He never raised his voice, very soft-spoken, but he said, you know, anybody can be clean and they can be on time. And I mean, he made no exception to that. And my part of my job was not only to be clean, but to see that he got there early. He wanted to be wherever he was supposed to be early. And that was part of my job. But you took care of uh, administrative details. You worked a little bit for his wife. Uh, he had children, but they were by and large adult children that were out of the household, so it was only he and his wife. So how long were you at Cherry Point with the general before you left for? Very brief time, I would say uh, maybe uh, three weeks. We stopped at the Marine Corps Air Station El Toro for several weeks. Uh, the general had his own airplane and I uh, enjoyed El Toro, uh, the uh, trip down to Laguna Beach. El Toro was up on a bluff and to get down to the beach there was a winding road that uh, took some getting used to if one imbibed at all, which I did. And uh, in due course we left and flew in his airplane. Where where was the uh, first Marine Aircraft Wing located? It was headquartered in Iwakuni, okay. uh, Japan, and it was headquartered, it had dual headquarters in K-3, which is a Marine Corps air station in uh, Pohangdong, Korea, which is south of Pusan. So what, when you were over there, what were the duties like? Well, it was uh, interesting. There were two general officers. My boss initially was assistant wing commander of the 1st Marine Air Wing. And uh, a general named Jack, General Jack, that was his last name, had two aides. He was a major general. And one of his aides ran the flag mess which had uh, two general officers and probably 15 colonels. And it was a challenging job, which it turns out was part of my duty to assist him in any way that I could. Interesting fact of those days, after dinner every night, well, before dinner, the, there was an open bar where you could buy drinks. 
and you used uh, script, I've forgotten the name of it, okay. but it, it, it was not American dollars, it was script that the we, military we, issued. It's called MPC. Man. MPC, yeah. exactly. I couldn't remember the name. And uh, I remember being astounded that the gin was cheaper than the tonic. <laughs> I could buy tonic, you know, uh, but it was very expensive to get tonic. And many of those colonels in the warm weather drank gin and tonic. So I would tell the bartender, more gin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give them too much tonic. <laughs> but we could get limes. Yeah, okay. uh, I lived with the other two aides in a little hut. Our, our hut uh, was probably about the size of this room, actually. Uh, probably 20 feet by 20 feet. It had three bunks in it. And uh, we had a Korean houseboy, I guess we called him that. His name was Pak Bak Tay. I don't know what his last name, what his full name was, but you would know when Pak Bak Tay got there because he had had kimchi before he came. And in that small room, which was closed up, uh, the smell of kimchi would just overpower you. If you were asleep, you'd wake up. Could you just describe kimchi? Because a lot of people may not know what it is. Well, kimchi is, uh, I, I, I did, have never seen it made, so i start there. But it is vegetables uh, chopped up, and rumor had it that it was with dog meat chopped up. And I mean, the smell of it is, uh, I went to a dermatologist here in Atlanta about two years ago and stopped going because she ate kimchi and it brought back bad memories. <laughs> but she would come in in a little room, you know, an examining room, and her breath was so strong that it just knock you over. It, it, uh, it has a terrible, terrible odor. So you were... You were physically located at K3? Well, we traveled between okay. Iwakuni and K3. The general had a house at uh, Iwakuni. I did not live in the house with him. He lived there all alone. And it was a house used by both the commanding general and the assistant commanding <laughs> general. And they would alternate sometime between the two stations. Uh, the times that we were in K3, I lived in the little house that I've described, little hut that I've described for you, and the general had fairly rustic quarters himself. Uh, it was I, one of the interesting things I remember about checking into K3, we brought, the general had two stewards that he was uh, allocated under the table of organization for an assistant wing commander. And they helped with the flag mess. And they were both uh, black, nice, fairly well. One was a sergeant and one was a corporal. And they were both nice men. They flew out on the plane with us. And I got to know them pretty well. And when we reported into K3, it was a closed base. I mean, it had a complete concertina wire enclosure and a main gate that was strictly guarded. And yet no women were allowed on the base. And yet both of the stewards within 48 hours had venereal disease, which they <laughs> somehow had picked up. <laughs> well, did... And I gather that was not an uncommon uh, event among white or black. Yeah. Did you have any interaction with the uh, Korean community? Not really. Okay. Uh, we were, the wing was at that time flying the first jets uh, called the VJs, and then they were flying mostly uh, large single-engine planes that were 
designed to be provide close air support and bombers and uh, those planes could carry the equivalent of a bomb load of a B-17. They were that big okay. with one single engine. And we just stayed on our base and when we went to uh, Japan, I had free access to the community in Japan, okay. but not much interplay with the Koreans. Was did you feel secure when you were in Korea? Yes, the war was over by that yeah. point. By that point, the truce, this would have been in point of time, uh, let's see, probably 1955. Okay. And the truce had been enacted. And interestingly, one of the collateral duties that my boss, General Croft, was given was the U.S. representative on the Truce Commission at Panmunjom, which was a U.N. Uh, facility. And we went probably during my tour, tour in, the, in the Far East in those days without a wife. I didn't have one, but if I had had one, I would have been required to leave her at home. Uh, a tour was one year. And so probably in my one year, General Croft was called to meet with the uh, KPA CPV, which stands for Korean People's Army and Chinese People's Volunteers. They each had senior general officers who met in a little room about the size of this room with the table and we all heard about how the uh, supposedly truce was signed and enforced in a room that split the 38th parallel. Well, believe it or not, there was a table that supposedly sat on the 38th parallel, and on one side of the table were the UN command flags, and on one side were the KPA CPV flags. And Frequently, those gentlemen who were senior staff were like Pak Bak Tay. They had kimchi before they came to the meeting, and the room had no windows and was just a closed room with a door that opened on our side to our side of the 38th parallel, and on their side, it opened to their side of the 38th parallel. So I, I take it you were at least in the room for some of Oh, these yes. Things. I sat. Uh, I didn't have a seat at the table because it wasn't about me in any sense, but I sat uh, adjacent to my general and slightly back from him. And as I remember, we had uh, Turkish. Marines always like to be with the Turks. Turks don't run. You know, they. if you had Turks on your flank, you knew you were safe. So we had a Turkish ranking commander, general officer equivalent, a British equivalent, uh, and one other, I don't remember, but maybe Portuguese. He spoke another language. So that for a, and most of the meetings were called, by the way, by the KPA CPV people, and they would lash us in their talk for one hour, and then it had to be repeated in Korean, Chinese, English, uh, Turkish, and Portuguese. So what would be a one hour conversation, wasn't a conversation, it was a statement, uh, it usually lasted five or six hours, and then we of course had to have a reply. Frequently, it would be the next day. We're would you characterize those, if we use the term loosely, talks as hostile or? There wasn't overt hostility, but it, there, I'm trying to remember whether there were handshakes even. I don't okay. think there were. I think they came in to their side and we came in our side and uh, our two groups sat down at the table, and I don't remember ever shaking hands with 
or seeing anyone. Perhaps they did. I, that doesn't mean that they were hostile. It just yes. means that we were adversaries. Was it tense? Yeah, it was a little tense. The uh, U.S. UN command group used big, burly uh, soldiers, typically, uh, as, and they carried uh, weapons, shoulder weapons. And the other side, on their side of the fence, there was a chain link fence with concertina on the top that came up to the side of the house. And on the other side, you'd see this ragtag guy that had no shoes to speak of and a poor looking excuse for a uniform. And that was the contrast that was yeah. made. At the time you were in Korea, during the period you, I'm sorry, in Japan, uh, it was 10 years after, the, uh, after World War II. What, did you interact with uh, the Japanese communities at all? Yes, uh, the, it, it was, there were no lingering effects. We were, I think, 20 miles from Hiroshima, Iwakuni is. Okay. And uh, I went to Hiroshima once, and it was beginning to evolve into the Hiroshima that it is today. I've seen videos that are, other than their memorial, yeah. it, it really does not reflect uh, the Hiroshima of the bomb. The house person, that a woman, who cleaned our house in Japan. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember her name. I didn't think I'd ever forget it, but she had her back. She was outdoors and had her back to the center of Hiroshima or toward Hiroshima when the bomb exploded. And she showed us on her back how she had on a print dress when that happened, and it was on her back, perfect. Just like somebody had uh, printed it on her back. Was, was there... And there was no hostility. Oh, I was just gonna ask you if there was uh, any resentment. Not, uh, well, there may be, she didn't show it. Uh, I happen to be, one of the things I remember most vividly is that one night, I had uh, to come back to the office for something. And she was, uh, she was the woman, not the same woman that I mentioned, but another cleaning woman was in there cleaning the office. And she cleaned up to the general's flag and took her hands like this and bowed down. She didn't know I was there. I was just looking. And then she got over to the American flag, which he had on the other side of his office, and did the same thing. I don't know whether, what the emotions that went with yeah. that were, but we, we did not sense any strong resentment at all. What, what were some of your daily duties when you were in Westpac? Well, uh, we traveled quite a bit. We had a squadron at Atsugi, which is just outside Tokyo. It was a naval air station at Sugi, and we had a helicopter squadron at Opama, which is near o uh, Yokohama, and we traveled around quite a bit. Uh, it turns out one of my side duties was to escort the visiting brass who frequently came to through our uh, facilities to go to Hong Kong. And so it was my duty to fly with them and... Keep them out of trouble? Keep them out of trouble. And uh, sometimes that was a challenge. Most of the time it was not. What, what, most of the time what I did was I knew people who made suits, who did good work at a fair price and would do it quickly. And most of the people who came 
uh, wanted to buy clothing or uh, leather goods, which were available in Hong Kong at uh, electronics, and not become no, no, there was no such thing as a computer in that day and age at all. So you, how long were you in the Far East? A year. A year. Okay. So when when your tour was up, did you and the general come back, or just you? No, the, the general. Uh, I think asked me if I would like to stay with him, and I would. He, as I have said, I can't say enough about this man. He was the, one of the smartest people, one of the nicest people, but you didn't cross him. You knew that there was an iron fist in the velvet glove, and uh, I said, absolutely, if you will have me, I would go. I'd stay with you, and his next assignment was as Commander Marine Air Reserve Training, COMART, okay. C-O-M-A-R-T, which has, is uh, at headquartered at Glenview, Illinois, and uh, it's a naval air station with a uh, rear admiral in charge of the air station, and the general had his own plane, as he always did, and our job was to visit every weekend a Marine Air Reserve training unit, and part of my job was to see that the, that the uh, communications were set up and that they knew we were coming and we, we knew where we were going. And uh, So there was a lot of logistics work. A lot of logistics. Yeah. And it was a generally, it was a, Glenview was built on an 18-hole golf course. Uh, it started out as a 36-hole golf course, and they, during World War II, they closed 18 holes and put up Quonset huts and closed the runway and uh, made it into a naval air station. And General Croft did not play golf. And it was an outstanding golf course. It had uh, very few hills, which made it very attractive to play. And I, you know, from Greensboro, Georgia, if you'd ask me what a golf club was when I lived in Greensboro, I'd have said, what do you kill with that? Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what a golf ball, what a golf bat. We just... I'm ready. So did you, did you play golf? I did not. Okay. Uh, General Croft did not play golf. And he said to me shortly after we got there, he said, Lloyd, I don't play golf. And I said, I don't know whether you do or not. And I said, well, General, I do not. I, I really never had a golf club in my hands. He said, well, you will learn to play golf and you will learn to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> and I did both. <laughs> Those guys that came in were, you know, sharp golfers, played uh, every chance they had. And I had taken some lessons from the pro there, and on the best day of my life, I shot a 90, and that was a banner day. You know, I usually was a high 90, early 100 mm -hmm. shooter, but you can play uh, enough to lose money with good <laughs> golfers if you uh, shoot that kind of golf. And that was my assignment, to play with those fellas, and then We'd, I'd take them over to the uh, O Club, Officers Club, and we'd have a drink, and then they'd go their way and I'd go mine. So were these VIPs? That oh, boy, they were, yes. They were, you know, anywhere from uh, three or four star generals to uh, vice admirals, full admirals, and uh, I, I would live in the BOQ. I would get up early in the morning and go out and play five or six holes and then go in, take my shower, have my breakfast, and go pick up the general. I had to go. We had a general, and the driver's name was Johnny Dollar, believe it or not, and I remember Johnny Dollar from Alabama. He was a super nice guy, a white kid, uh, and 
I've often wondered what happened to Dollar. He was a good man. What rank was he? He was a PFC, I PFC. think. PFC. Yeah. So, how long were you there? Did you? Did you? Well, leave? we were there the rest of my tour. Which, okay. uh, let's see, that's. I was in four years, a little over four years by the time you yeah. count OCS and basic school. So we must have stayed more than a year because okay. I finished out my tour of active duty while I was at Glenview. Met my wife there, by the way. Uh, was she an, an, an Illinoisan? She is from Lake Forest, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And the, my most memorable event about that was that I went to a party with the general and his wife that the admiral of the base had. And he had his uh, older son had invited a few friends. And Mary Ann, my wife, came with one of the friends. And the admiral's aide, who was also single, and I were bored. We, our job was to see that our bosses did not get molested and that they always had a drink and their wives. And so and the admiral's aide's name was Jerry. I don't remember Jerry's last name, but Jerry bet me five bucks that I couldn't get a date with the prettiest girl at the party. And I said, oh, I bet you I can. And so we shook hands on it, and I worked on Marianne, who turned out to be the one he picked, all night. Did Finally had her date cut out entirely, and I ended up with uh, her name and a telephone number on a piece of paper. And I took it back to Jerry, and I said, okay, here it is. Here's, I take my five bucks. He said, that's not, he said, I'm not gonna pay for that. He said, she just made that up. That's not real. And so we went into the BOQ at about 11.30 at night and called that number. They had a telephone booth like the British have. I'm sure you've seen them. And we were both in the telephone booth with the phone here, and the phone rang 20 times, and I could see Jerry saying, he was nodding his head, this isn't real. And about that time, her father picked up the telephone. And I said, may I speak with Mary Ann, please? He said, who is this? And I said, well, I, I just want to speak to Mary Ann. He said, we don't call Mary Ann after nine o'clock. And I looked at Jerry and he nodded that he'd pay and I hung up <laughs> and he never knew. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know who called? He didn't know who called. Smart and I food. certainly wasn't going to tell him. <laughs> so so after you left the Marine Corps, what, 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 where, where, did, where did life take you? Well, I was engaged to be married at the time I left the Marine Corps. By that time, Mary Ann and I had decided that uh, we were each the, the one for the other. And I had been accepted to Emory Law School, and I had made arrangements to live in one of the dorms as a counselor and I had, uh, I'd be in the reserves. And I had, you know, I had to generate some income. My reserve pay would help. And so I started law school and we were scheduled to get married in June of the year that I, I started mid-year and after the first semester I would get married and we'd move into the dorm and hopefully live happily ever after. Turns out she called off the wedding. And uh, it's hard to do this at long distance. I bummed a ride on one of those big propeller planes, an AD. It has a place in the belly where people can fit. It's not a seat, but there's a place, I guess it's the Bombay, but I bummed a ride up to, to uh, the right. Naval Air Station and got up to Lake Forest and did my best to talk her and her mother out of that decision. I can remember I sat down at the foot of the bed and they said, well, you know, 
uh, you're not a Catholic. Everybody up there is a Roman Catholic, at least everybody that I saw. Uh, you're from a different culture, and, and Marianne just decided that this isn't the time, and she was only 19. I was 22, and uh, she's too young. And so I licked my wounds and came back down and finished law school and had just started practicing law with what is now the firm Alston and Bird. It was then called Alston, Sibley, Miller, Spann, and Shackelford. I was the eighth lawyer in this, what then was a large firm. And I was, had my little office, which is probably, you could have three of those in this room, just room enough for my desk and a chair, and the phone rang, and the switchboard said, there is a Mr. Bands out here to see you. I said, I don't know any Mr. Bands, and she said, well, he asked for you by name. And I said, all right. I thought, boy, this is my first client. I'll go see him. Brought him back. He sat in the chair and he said, you don't know me, but I was engaged to Mary Ann also, and she called it off. And I said, oh. He said, I don't understand it. His best man, it turns out, was from Atlanta, and he had come down to Atlanta to lick his wounds. <laughs> so I took him to lunch. And on the way back, I bought a, uh, I was making $300 a month at the time, big money. But I bought a $100 wedding present and sent it to Mary Ann, knowing that her mother would make her send it back and that that would put us back in touch with each other. And uh, sure enough, a few days later, the phone rang and it was Mary Ann. And I, she said, uh, Lloyd? And I said, yes. And I said, how are you? You're Mrs. Bands, right? She said, no, we didn't get married. And I said, oh, is that right? I said, I sent you a wedding press. She said, well, I know that. And it came. And uh, the, the upshot of it was I said, well, why don't you come down here and let's see if we're still friends? And she agreed to come, and we got married three days later. Really? <laughs> wow. For a Catholic, that's yeah, pretty remarkable. That is, yeah. And uh, the, the reason it worked, I, I, first of all, I went out to uh, the Cathedral of Christ the King to see the priest about setting up the wedding. And the priest laughed at me. He said, I won't even see you. He said, this is, you can't even discuss this. So I went to the senior partner in my firm, who I knew knew the senior partner at King & Spalding, another large Atlanta firm. But I also knew that the senior partner was a Catholic and that he knew the archbishop. And so I said, Philip, please tell uh, Mr. Spalding that I'm okay and have him tell the archbishop that I'm okay and maybe he'll tell the priest I'm okay and and it worked and we got married on a uh, hot August morning August 31st what was the reaction from her parents well her father was uh, it was a lawyer was out in Kansas negotiating uh, a contract with a labor union for one of the telephone companies and we called him the night before two of us and said uh, John we're getting married tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at Christ the King and we'd love to have you come but I know that's not possible and he said well why don't you wait six months and if you know, if she loves you now, she'll love you then. And we said, no, we're doing it uh, in the morning, but we'll miss you. And he said, no, you won't. I'll be there. <laughs> and he was. 
Was, was her mother there With also? her mother and her two younger brothers. She has one brother that's 12 years younger than she and one that's 10 years. They had on Bermuda shorts and uh, a, they threw me a curve. On the morning of the wedding, they told me that I had to have a Catholic witness. And I didn't even know any Catholics. And then it hit me that uh, I had a Catholic fraternity brother named Richard Reynolds. And Richard was a lawyer with Troutman Sanders. And so I called Richard, I hadn't seen him in 50 years, and said, Richard, this is Lloyd Whitaker, a voice from your past. I have an unusual request, but I'm getting married at 10 o'clock. This was at about nine o'clock. <laughs> and I need for you to be at uh, Christ the King at 10 o'clock to be my witness. And he said, I'll do it. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. It yeah, was it meant was... to be. So how did life proceed from there? Well, Mary Ann was uh, teaching. Had We got her a job in the DeKalb uh, school system, and I was practicing law. And we lived in a duplex, the owner of which was a Mr. Varney Doe. I remember when we moved in, he had a pistol that was about this big, and he said, you know, you feel safe. It was at, on uh, right off of Peachtree Battle Avenue, one of those little feeder streets, and it wasn't the best neighborhood. But he said, don't worry about it. said, I've got the pistol. <laughs> and I didn't know whether to worry more about him having the pistol or, to, or but we, we stayed there until we bought our first house. Our first house cost $17,000. And we'd clutch ourselves at night and say, what have we done? <laughs> Unbelievable. I was probably, had moved up maybe to $400 a, a month at that point. So how old were you about this time? Well, I must have been 23. Okay. Still a young man. Yeah, and Mary Ann was 20. Well, oh, yeah. Let's see, if she was 21, I'm four years older, so I would have been 24. Okay. But... Uh, so did you start a family? We did. Uh, we have three children. Our children are adopted, all three of them. Uh, our oldest is 52, our second oldest, we have boy, girl, boy. Our second oldest is 47 or 48, and our youngest is 43, and he has just had a liver transplant. He uh, owned a sports bar, and his mother and I suspect that he was in the sauce, although he probably wouldn't yeah. own up to that. But I think that's, but you know, we don't know. He's an adopted child. We don't know a thing about his, his heritage. His history, yeah. Is he doing well? Well, he just, believe it or not, about six months ago got a liver. Five years he was, oh. he, he was, uh, had end-stage liver disease, that's what they call it, which means that if he had not ultimately gotten a liver, he'd have died. And uh, he was at, the, there's a liver program at Emory and a liver program at Piedmont, and he was in the liver program at Piedmont. And you can imagine in five years, I was tearing my hair out. Yeah. I, I'd try threatening him. I'd try to bribe him. <laughs> I wanted him to have a liver. I didn't much care how we got it. And uh, the uh, the doctor who was the, in charge of the program said, Mr. Whitaker, I talk to you, but only because you don't shout at me. <laughs> so you can imagine livers yeah. are very tightly regulated. 
and they are, you can't be during this five year period, he could not be more than an hour away from Piedmont Hospital because livers have a life, a shelf life of no more than three hours from the time of the harvest until the transplant. So we are very happy that he seems to be doing Good. well. And that well, how long how long ago was the transplant? I beg your pardon. How long ago was the transplant? I would say it was six months ago. Oh, really? Is six, that recent? Yeah. yeah. So okay. he's uh, he's just gotten permission to seek to find a job, and he's looking for a job. I don't know what he can do, uh, but it's time for him to get off the payroll yeah. well, if he I mean, can. He start his life again. Yeah. 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 He has, he's married. He has a wife and two children. His wife had two children when he married her, and those children have grown up. One is uh, college age, and the other will be college age next year. So the, does, do your children all live in the Atlanta area? No. Okay. No, our daughter lives in uh, Orofino, Idaho. She's married to a doctor, and she is uh, very independent. Our daughter, she's a, what I would call a true tree hugger. Uh, she's wanted to go to the West. When we were all younger, we would... Uh, hire an outfitter and go out in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, which is a vast area out in Idaho where tree cutting and garbage disposal, none of that is allowed. And Sarah loved it. Her name's Sarah Tate, my middle name. Okay. And uh, so when she graduated, she went to Randolph-Macon Woman's College, and when she graduated, she said, Dad, I've never uh, been able to, in the summertime, do what I'd like to do. I'd like to go work in Yellowstone for the summer. And so uh, we said, okay, and that was it. She was gone. And she decided that she wanted to move out west. She worked initially for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and they give you a byline in lieu of a salary. <laughs> Not really, but, uh, you know, her, her salary was $12,000 a year. Uh, did I jerk? On camera. So, Sarah Tate uh, is, has one child. She was, uh, she didn't get married until she was 42. I thought she was going to be a spinstress. And uh, she put in for eHarmony, believe it or not, without talking to her mother and me. Had a glamour picture shot, and she probably interviewed 40 different guys. As you know, this is how it works. They meet somewhere for coffee, and if both of them want to see the it, relationship continued, they make another one. She did not. And along came this doctor named Kelly McGrath from uh, Orofino. And uh, somehow it clicked with them, and there it went. And so she got married out there. Well, if you're an outdoors person, Idaho is not a bad place to be. Well, she, she truly loves the outdoors. And as I said, they have one child. In, she called one night. To, they were jumping up and down on the bed and said, I'm pregnant. She was 43, I think, at the time, and Kelly was probably 50. And Kelly's a very practical guy. I said, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm afraid to have another one. This one has turned out so well. And uh, he subscribes to the view that the male sperm, after a certain age is, gets weaker or you're more likely to have some problem with the child, so they have one child. Our other son is 52 and he got married last year. Uh, married a lady that he had known in his work. He is a uh, quality control person, unusual situation. 
He works for the company that provides senior health care, like Visiting Angels, which I'm sure you've heard okay, about, yeah. but this is not Visiting Angels. This is a company that has virtually a monopoly on the health, senior health care in the state of Connecticut. And he lives in St. Petersburg. And he monitors over the telephone every call that the workers in there okay. and their clients have. And that's his job. And he had met his wife, his future wife, in connection with that. And our younger son, I've told you, start, owned a sports yeah. bar. And uh, Well, that sounds like a great family. Uh, it's a nice family, yeah. As we're coming to the end of the time here, I'd like to give you the opportunity to just editorialize and just speak your mind about any topic, any subject, whether it was you know your experience in the military or the world. Well, as you may or may not know, Mary Ann and I have uh, pledged to give a large sum of money to the Atlanta History Center. And uh, the way that came about, I was reading the Sunday paper with her at uh, the Corner Cafe where we go for breakfast every Sunday morning. And we'd been looking for a place to give some money that would make the money worthwhile and something that we'd be proud we'd done. And we read about the problems with the cyclorama and I mentioned that my mother was a senior history teacher I had seen the cyclorama more than once, and Mary Ann had seen it, and uh, we said, bingo, that's it. And so I called Sheffield, and I knew Sheffield's father very well. He's a contemporary of mine, Bradley Hale. I knew his mother also, but I knew his father quite well, who was a lawyer at King and & Spalding. And I said, Sheffield, I'd like to have lunch with you. And Sheffield and I had lunch at the Corner Cafe. And I told him that we had uh, this pool of money that we'd been looking forward to finding something to invest it in. And Sheffield is born to do what he's doing. He took our $10 million gift and raised another $25 million to make the cyclorama a reality, got the political connections. You know, they're part of the Atlanta City Council that I worried uh, may not even acknowledge that Buckhead is in the city. So if you're moving something from Grant Park, uh, such as an icon like the cyclorama, Sheffield got it done. And I, I just can't say enough about him. Just for the record, Sheffield Hale is the head of the Atlanta History. Yes, he's the president and chief executive, executive officer, officer, and he is probably about the age of my uh, oldest son. As I mentioned, I knew his father was my contemporary very well, and Sheffield must be in his early 50s, but he was born to do what he's mm. doing. He, uh, I, he I, was I, with uh, Kilpatrick Stockton, a fine law firm here in Atlanta, and then he was the uh, general counsel for the, uh, for the American Cancer Society. And bingo, this job came along. And yeah, I wasn't aware that, that you had made that contribution, but uh, I know Sheffield, and he's really a dynamic guy, and I can I, tell I'm he's telling doing you, he, what he was he, put here to do. Yeah, he is, uh, he is just a remarkable guy. And he's handled it beautifully. I mean, he, he didn't miss a beat. When I told him about that money that day at lunch, I would say that he had a call in that afternoon for people to give the, the uh, balance of the money. It's a very expensive operation, mm -hmm. getting that thing restored and uh, moved and cleaned up. And there's a new building being built, as you know, right here where the cyclorama will go, and the uh, locomotive, the, the Texas, dam. is being restored up in North Carolina, and the painting will move this December if things go as we anticipate. So that's my statement. Well, great. 
I appreciate it. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. You have a great story. Well, um, it's the story of my life. I know, but it's it's a good story, and uh, we want to thank you for that, and thank you for your service. Well, also. Tony, thank you very much, and thank you for your service. <laughs> All we Marines say, semper fi to fi. each other. Or Ura. Ura. Where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for your service and thank you for taking time. Well, thank you. Today. I've enjoyed being here. Thank Brought you. back a lot of memories. Good. Well, we're glad we got to hear them. <laughs>